We're going to turn now to our third anchor panel, um, and that is on water and agriculture, resilience through better information. Managing natural resources, especially water and food systems, typically relies on imperfect science and best estimates. Advances in technology, information systems, and data sharing are making real-time decisions possible. As water information becomes more accurate, new flexible adaptations to climate change can make a real change for drought res resilience. From supply chain to waste reuse, the agriculture sector is closing the loop on waste. The panel will explore the benefits, next steps, and risks of information about our lifelines of food and water. Uh, again, I want to recognize our colleagues at UC Merced, who are the ones who organized and will chair this panel. Uh, it was organized by Dr. Aaron Hester, Assistant Professor and Associate Director of Citrus at Merced, and Dr. Lee Bernacki, the Executive Director of Citrus at UC Merced. UC Merced is home to the Ag Aid Institute, a collaborative USDA NEFA Institute for Agricultural AI for Transforming Workforce and Decision Support, and UC Merced's new Experimental Smart Farm, the Center for Food Resilience Through Equity, Sustainability, and Health, or FRESH, I love that acronym, a 40-acre site adjacent to campus that will be testing and advancing ag tech solutions. So I wanna welcome Aaron Hester to the stage. Um, thank you, Camille, for that fantastic introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone here for, for joining us for this exciting panel. Uh, it is um, certainly water has been on our minds uh, and has been the subject of a lot of attention here in California, but also across the world. And it is my great pleasure to introduce a number of fantastic panelists who are here to share with us that some of their thoughts on the intersection of water and agriculture and how technology can help us uh, build resilience. Um, Nusha Ajami is a Berkeley Lab Earth and Environmental Sciences Area Research Specialist. Uh, she's the Chief Strategy and Development Officer for research there. Tara Moran is the President and CEO at California's Water Data Consortium. And Connie Bowen is uh, the co-founder of Farmhand Ventures, a venture capital firm focusing on ag tech, uh, ag technologies. Um, and so what I'd like to do is start by asking our panelists to share a three minute introduction of themselves and tell us a little bit about your focus on the future of food and water and some of the technical approaches that you are using. And I'd like to start by inviting uh, Dr. Ajami from the Berkeley Lab, uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences area to share that with us. Yeah, hi everyone, thank you for having me. It's uh, really uh, wonderful to be here. Um, as Aaron mentioned, I uh, direct our um, work around strategic work around um, water and um, energy initiatives in the Berkeley Lab. Uh, a lot of the focus that we have uh, right now is try to understand what connects the two, uh, especially as we are looking at our uh, energy transition and uh, decarbonization. A lot of those activities do have environmental and water footprints that are not very well understood and very well captured. So my goal at the lab is try to see if we can use some of our existing uh, talent and knowledge and try to see if we can map from climate to energy to water and better capture that uh, those interlinks. Um, uh, before coming here, I was at Stanford and I was the colleague of Tara Moran, which was wonderful. And a lot of the work we did there actually was focused a, a little bit the other way around, a little bit focused on how water sectors transition is going to impact our energy needs and uh, what are the different ways that uh, we have to incorporate or consider energy as we are thinking about uh, recycling, reuse, desalination, demand management, um, to basically reduce our water, uh, reduce our water use, therefore reduce our energy footprint, or actually change our water source and potentially increase our water footprint. So we try to capture some of those pieces along the way uh, by doing different kind of work, especially focusing on using big data and information technology to inform this process in different ways. I'll pass it to you, Aaron. 
Thank you, Nusha. Um, certainly water, food, and energy are intimately related, and we do need to consider these as a system if we're going to achieve a resilient future. Um, Connie, I'd like to, to shift to you next. Um, so what are we looking at from the venture capital space and investment in technology for the future of food and water? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Aaron, and, and thanks for having me and listening all. Um, uh, I'll start kind of to give a little context on myself. Um, I am probably the least technical on this panel. I studied engineering way back when at Swarthmore, but I spent my entire career in the investment space in impact, agri-food, and technology. Um, so investing in early stage companies, commercializing solutions um, to you know build win-win economic solutions for farms and farmers and all the kind of relevant stakeholders in agriculture that also create positive environmental outcomes, uh, be that in water management or, or elsewhere. So um, I was a founding team member at the Yield Lab. I'm, I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and that's where kind of the Yield Lab started. And, and I invest with them internationally in, in Europe and in Latin America and Asia Pacific. It's a family of funds. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time, I've also spent some time in farmland investment, so a different asset class, but trying to use my relatively, for investor world, uh, technical lens um, to ask good questions and ensure that dollars and resources are going to people who are developing solutions for problems. Um, so, and, and yeah, today I work on a venture studio and fund. Um, I'm very focused on, I guess you might say, financial engineering uh, to, again, ensure that the right resources are going to the right places to solve problems with an equity and inclusion kind of lens in place. Um, for instance, I don't know that I've ever seen a venture capital firm talk to a farm worker. And also, when you're thinking about ag tech adoption, maybe that's a good stakeholder to talk to. Um, and so, so that's something that we focus on in Farmhand Ventures, my, my firm today. Uh, I'll, I'll let Tara introduce herself and then we'll get into it, I'm sure, more. Thank you, Connie. Yes, um, Tara, please tell us a little bit about your background and uh, the California Water Data Consortium. Sure, thank you so much for having me here today and looking forward to the discussion. Um, I run the California Water Data Consortium. It's a relatively new organization. Um, it was founded in 2019, really in response to, to a need identified during the last drought here in California, um, where it was just really apparent that both state and local agencies didn't have access to the data that they needed to make well-informed water management decisions. And so in response to that need, uh, the legislature passed what's called the Open and Transparent Water Data Act. And, and what's particularly unique, unique about this act is it requires state agencies to make water and ecological data available on open source platforms. But as the piece of legislation was being drafted, there was recognition that meeting sort of those legislative mandates wouldn't achieve these broader goals that both you know, Connie and Nusha have talked a little bit about which is really how do we ensure that that agencies or locals or VCs have the information that they need to make well-informed water management decisions? Is the data that is made available useful? Can it inform decisions? Is it interoperable? Can we look at it at scale? And so with that recognition, there was inclusion of a clause that allowed the state implementing agencies to partner with a nonprofit organization. And so that is the California Water Data Consortium. As I mentioned, we're founded in 2019, and we are an independent nonprofit 501c3 organization that really supports states' implementation of this act. Um, and we provide this venue for state, non-state decision-making around water data governance. Um, and so to get to your question about what's our interest in terms of, of agriculture and the like, and in ag tech in particular, we are advancing several different projects that really demonstrate the value of open and water, open and transparent water data. But I think most relevant to, to this work is an open source water accounting platform that we're developing and scaling um, across the state of California to really inform local 
both local water managers as well as to Ghani's point, landowners who are really at the are are required to implement often the the legislative requirements. And I can talk a little bit more about some of the regulatory requirements and legal requirements that are driving some of the innovation around ag tech here in California. Um, but I think you know ag tech is really burgeoning in California in part because both technology and agriculture are really at the heart of what um, of, of the state here. Um, and so that combination is really, really being driven. The other piece is that, yeah, we do have la- legal and regulatory changes that are, are creating sort of this, this broader environment that's fostering innovation. And then as Nusha mentioned, um, we were both at Stanford prior to, uh, prior to my current role, um, where we worked really at the intersection of both research and, and policy. And so um, excited to be here and talking about that. Thank you, Tara. And and as you and the other panelists said, water and food and energy systems are all really intimately related. And all of you are working on these different aspects of tech-enabled resilience to help get us to that resilient future. What what exactly does tech-enabled resilience mean to you? And Tara, maybe we'll start with you and you can also help us. You alluded some, to some of those new regulatory frameworks that are driving a lot of uh, necessity and innovation. Maybe you can help uh, define some of those for our audience as well. Sure, yeah, happy to. Um, so I'll start with your first question, question and then circle back to it maybe. Um, So to me, uh, tech-enabled resilience really means technology that supports or enables decision-making, both in the near term, but also on a longer trajectory. And and some of what is motivating some of the innovation, certainly not all of it, but here in California, in the particularly in the agricultural sector, is passage of relatively recent um, legislation. So in two, and I'll just touch on it briefly. But I do think it's important because motivation for the passage of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act really demonstrates how intertwined water and food systems are both here in California, but beyond. And so in 2014, California passed what's called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. It's commonly referred to as SIGMA. (laughs) Um, And for those of you who may not be familiar with water and, and groundwater in California, Groundwater is the water that's stored underground in sort of large sand and gravel um, deposits called aquifers or groundwater basins. And in California, this groundwater accounts for about 40 to 60 percent of of the state's water supply in a given year. And, And this is coming up here because agricultural success really wouldn't be possible without irrigation and and indeed Agriculture accounts for about 80% of the water use in the in the state. And so legislation, this Sigma, is really impacting agricultural users and communities throughout the state um, because of this link between um, water and food systems. And so just briefly, the legislation um, was passed. And what it does is it requires the vast majority of groundwater basins throughout the state, which were largely unregulated. Uh, prior to its passage, to bring their basins into balance. And that either needs to be done through increases in in import of water, increases in recharge, which all have some innovation associated with them. Alternatively, it requires them to reduce the amount of pumping that's taking place, um, which again is driving innovation as we think about how can we be more efficient? How do we communicate how those reductions need to take place? And so I'll just touch briefly on a a piece of software that we're currently working on, um, which is really being developed in partnership with Environmental Defense Fund, Department of Water Resources, and State Water Resources Control Board, where we're scaling an open source groundwater accounting platform that integrates data from a variety of different sources. And what it does is it essentially links district level water budgets directly with parcel level information so that landowners can plan for their growing season. They can really understand what their water use is, how it relates to district level goals, and and then make planning decisions associated with it. Um, It also runs a cloud-based scenario planning that allows people to really think about what happens in our district. If I recharge water here, if if we cut pumping, what will that do to groundwater levels in other regions of the state? 
And so I think, again, back to your question of how does tech, um, what does tech enabled resilience look like? I think, again, it's really ensuring that there are a variety, that data are displayed in a way that's useful to a variety of different users. And Great. Thank you, Tara. You know, and, and you really hit on a variety of different users. Um, Nusha, what does, um, what do, what does that user base look like for tech-enabled resilience? And what lens does equity have in the role of, of tech in water, food, and energy systems? That's an excellent question. I think maybe I use Tara's example and go back a little bit. I, you know, it's it's always exciting to think about data uh, and how it can enable us to move forward. But touching on something that Connie said, uh, data in vacuum can be a problem sometimes because you need to have local context, understand um, how decision making is made at, at at an individual level, at a you know a parcel level, at a local you know regional level, like just go up scale, and then connect that bottom up approach to whatever tool we have on the top, and to you know to guarantee actually usage. Um, because people can easily, um, you know, move away from technology if they feel it's just um, uh, providing a tool for somebody else to do the right thing, but it's not necessarily enabling them to be make better decisions at the local level. Um, so I think that goes back to the concept of equity and access and democratizing data, because that goes back to the fact that Everybody needs to be involved in this process. And what does that mean? And who has access? And who is at the table when you are making these kind of decisions or you're bringing these concepts to the, to the table? Um, just to give you a perspective, and um, a lot of the work that we did at Stanford was actually focused on bringing people to the table and working with them to understand what questions they have. And then those questions were then translated into what kind of science can be built? What kind of technology can be built? What kind of solutions can be crafted that helps address those local individual or uh, this, like what, whatever decision that needs to be made and whatever scale that needs to be made? Uh, the two values in that one is there's always a buyer at the end of the day. I think Connie appreciates that. I think then somebody is somebody is willing to take that tool. And the second thing is you are actually really making an impact in that process. I'll give you another example on the whole uh, concept of technology and um, equity. Um, example is a little, bit, a little bit away from California, but I think it's a very good context to kind of think about how things can actually go south, <laughs> not necessarily in a positive way. You can make right decisions. Yeah, many of us don't, may, might, might not think about it, but a lot of us actually do go to grocery store and buy strawberries that are coming from Mexico. And in a project we did, in um, last uh, couple of years ago, we actually went down to uh, Baja, California, which a lot of these products is being grown. And when you are taking these products and buying them, you're not thinking about, it's as Mexico, but you're not thinking about the process that enables this, right? And what's happening there is, there is a serious case of groundwater overdraft and seawater intrusion in Baja California, because a lot of these farms, they, in order to grow these fresh fruits or, or berries, they actually need to use water that it has low salinity. And for people who are actually, might not be familiar with this, the aquifer that Tara mentioned can actually, in, when you are in a coastal region, is connected to the seawater. So as you take water out of that aquifer, the seawater can come in and fill in the space. And actually the more you take, the more salty your water becomes. And a lot of these farms actually have desalination plants, talking about technology on farm, using a lot of energy that is being used to treat the water to use to grow the berries. Um, and there are a couple of things there. One, um, you know, there's a, you know, energy is an expensive commodity, but there was the tariff that was passed in Southern, in uh, Mexico that uh, made access to electricity very cheap for some of the industries. 
So that may that enabled this technological um, uh, sort of um, on, the uptake, and that means that we are actually for the with the cost of having cheap electricity, we are overusing our water, uh, which is having a problem. Now, hold this thought. Now, let me put you put both provided another side to this problem, which is farm workers that are working on these farms. They used to be. They used to, these people used to come to Baja California as temporary workers for a specific growing season to be able to work, and then they would go back. Uh, but now, because of this technology, we actually have um, a very specific, like the permanent farm workers that are in the region, staying day in and day out, which means that they need services. And unfortunately, because this has grown, um, you know, they're making money. Uh, uh, not a lot of money, but at least there's a financial security to them. They do not have services, education, access to water, access to sanitation. So we are actually leaving those people behind as we are growing this food. And um, one last note I will make there is groundwater is an angel. So it's like your, your bank account. So you put things in, you take things out, you need to put back you need to put back money back in for that saving account to have a value. Otherwise, it will be that empty account that you have that you can never, you are not ever able to draw from. And that is what's happening in some of these regions because you are taking a lot of groundwater out. There's not real good accounting mechanism. And there's this concept of race to zero, uh, especially when it's sometimes in the uh, in a more uh, sort of business oriented actions. Um, uh, you know, small farmers are a little different because they're very much attached to the land and the resources they depend on. And then you basically are overusing the groundwater, overusing the uh, resources, overusing the soil, leaving people behind, but you're growing strawberries and they're cheap and accessible. So um, I know this was a very dramatic example, but I think it's really important to think about some of the unintended consequences of some of the technologies and decisions and policies that we put in place because it can move things away from us. Then it's, you don't see, you don't feel, you don't think, you just use. So I saw Connie vigorously shaking her head when you were uh, mentioning unintended consequences. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on what tech-enabled resilience means for a future water, food, and energy system? Yeah, I, I'm so glad, Nisha, you brought up that actually specific example because it's a good one. And there are so many, there's no simple solutions here, right? Like there's just not. And there are going to be side effects to many solutions, and that's okay if the solution is, you know, the benefits outweigh the negative consequences. But I find in my industry, in venture capital startup land, we tend to exclusively focus on the upside potential, and in particular in impact. Uh, and I feel like I have to use air quotes when I do that, which tells you something about it. Uh, venture capital space. I I think that there's a challenge where often we aren't thinking about the risks, the impact side of risks. Um, and so I guess to apply, and honestly, there are so many directions that I can take this question around technology and, and climate smart ag. Um, I'm, I'm going to lead with the most important point to me. Um, and then I'm going to add one more kind of specific example around where technology, we have to be careful about seemingly simplistic solutions. So one, I want to double down on what Nusha said about considering the people doing the work. Um, for me personally, I got into agriculture because I was very stressed out about climate change and I wanted to have an impact from that standpoint. Um, as I have spent time working in fields alongside farm workers um, and as I have managed farm workers as employees, and as I've lived in a city that has a lot of poverty and food access issues, I have come to appreciate that ultimately at the end of the day, our agricultural system exists for people and it should not do, it, it both needs to be able to provide new, cheap nutrition and not do so at the expense of any people. And currently it's not quite doing that. And that is, inherently related to the sustainability water management elements of it, because 
if you think about now getting kind of technology, good products that leverage technology don't look like technology. You're not thinking about your AirPods and what's happening in there. Um, you know, good technology should just feel like something you want. And that should be true for farmers and their staff on their operations. And so it's really important, I think, when we think about ag technology to, to not just think about, okay, like what systematic level problem am I solving? Or, oh, I have this cool thing I've discovered. How can I find a market for it? We actually need to build solutions based on problems based on bringing the stakeholders to the table. And then when we go back and assess impact, both positive and negative, we need to be thinking about all the relative, relevant stakeholders in that. Um, the other, the, the, the kind of example point I wanted to make there is there's a ton of hype right now in ag and in US ag in specific around soil carbon, soil carbon storage, which is kind of silly because really it's soil, carbon dioxide soil, uh, carbon dioxide storage via soil. And there are a bunch of climate smart practices that can be taken. And now there's like a rush, gold rush of companies that are trying to verify, measure, record, and actually generally are using glorified surveys that translate through models into um, a, you know, a number a, a for CO2 capture or CO2 removal. And we're essentially trying to commoditize carbon dioxide. And we don't quite have the tools, the technology in place to do that properly today, I would argue. Yet we have policies starting to come into place that are assuming that those tools already exist. And that to me is scary and it's socially relevant because the way that in the US right now, these policies are kind of being rolled out and funding to kind of push these are being rolled out very much favors very large landholders and owners. And so we're kind of stretching the gap between the socioeconomic gap between smaller landowners, operators, and larger ones. And it's just, you know, maybe it's worth it because we need to sequester carbon dioxide, but we should probably think about it. Um, and it's really relevant because it's starting to happen in water too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just want to flag that one. So Connie, can I, can I oh I, please go ahead. Nisha. Can I quickly add to that? I Connie, thank you for mentioning that because that is that's one of the things I day in and day out right now think about. And I think the whole concept of energy transition and climate response is definitely taking over a lot of logical decision making that we have to do. And those unintended consequences of that, which we really do not understand. Um I have colleagues that they're whole excited, they have so much excitement about, for example, something called enhanced weathering, which is what I'm sure Connie is very familiar with, which is you bring rocks, you uh, specific kind of rocks, you put them on the ag land. And um, the idea is it would um, capture more carbon and also would produce, uh, you know, help the productivity of the land. Now, a lot of this test has been done in labs, no one has ever tested these in, uh, you know, large scale or has scaled this up. So um, we don't know if this is going to impact the soil in the long run. I mean, think about green, um, um, green revolution, which was very much talking about like, oh, my God, if you use all this biotechnology, bio, um, the bio um, so fertilizers is going to help you introduce productivity. So, you know, the soil, it, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to the soil. We don't know what's going to happen to the water. We don't know if this is going to really, um, uh, you know, leave, uh, you know, uh, leave to the promise that it's making. It's just like it's, it is a con. It is this unknown ball that we only know is this much of it. And I think Going back to something that we all started with, and Aaron, you mentioned this, the water, food, energy systems multiple times. It's unfortunate that we are very much fragmented when we are making these decisions. We make decisions in water. We don't think about energy. We make decisions in energy. We don't think about water. We make decisions on food. We don't think about e either of those things. So I think... Um, and this is how we have organized our academic education too. And I think it's key to think about that 
um, it is important to train people in specific t- uh, skill sets, but it's also important to generate as many people that can go across. That way you're capturing all your, you know, uh, the top and the bottom of your T at the same time, um, which is not what's happening right now. The, the one thing I just, I'll be, let, hand it back to Aaron to rein us back in, but just to like, uh, that to me is the bit, the, op, the opportunity and obligation actually for particularly research institution driven technology in agriculture is enabling that research to exist. Because right now, so many of our um, estimates for where emissions come from are extrapolations of very limited data sets. And that's making us make the wrong decisions. And that's terrifying. So just want to flag that. Tara looked like she just had to say something. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'm not sure if it's going to be that productive. I was going to say, I wanted to play devil's advocate a little bit, in part because I, I totally agree with everything that was said, but at the same time, um, I, I think there's always this chicken and egg. And and do we wait for the policies to come into place first and then let that you know drive the innovation? Or do we let some of the innovation get a little bit ahead of it and then start to develop policies to, to support it? And and I agree, we kind of are walking this line where right now decisions are being made that are likely, you know, not good decisions. But maybe that's required in order to, to kickstart some of that innovation. And then we need to let policy catch up as well. And so again, I don't, I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate, but I do think it's it's sometimes hard to think about it's sometimes hard to get enough attention on something until it's gone a little bit too far sadly so can i, I think, actually oh, yeah, and go ahead. i'm sorry one i don't want to derail this conversation but i think something tara said that i think it's quite important to um highlight I, you know policy making is a very complex process and it's very much of a window of opportunity kind of thing you have the right administration right set of people um, know enough, and that is when you make policy decisions. Um, you know, often people think about, you know, if you have an engineering degree, uh, after like 10 years, you can definitely do policy. This, this is an absolute really wrong kind of perspective. Policy making is very similar to if you say somebody is like, for example, if I'm a public policy major and somebody tells me even 10 years from now to build a dam, I cannot build a dam because I don't have that knowledge, right? So I think this is this is an important part. So I very much encourage people to learn about the policymaking process because it's very essential to what we are doing. And they, they, it, it impacts our lives. But on that point that Tara made, I think it is very much of a chicken and egg. You make a policy when you have the chance, you have an opportunity, you throw the opportunity, you push it through the window. Um but I think it's also an opportunity for us to react to it. And that is fine because people, there are, there is enough knowledge out there. It's just making sure you are directing that knowledge toward the right, right direction because policy doesn't get implemented right away. It takes time to implement policy. It takes time to set up the right institutions to, uh, to, um, to achieve that kind of a policy goal. So we've got three dimensions now. So we've got technology and innovation, we've got policy, and we've got kind of the right time and the right place for that policy. And then there's this fourth dimension that that Tara and Connie both mentioned, which is the F word or or funding. Um, and so what where how does funding play a role in this space? How does investment, whether it's like federal or state funding or whether it's philanthropic or venture capital, does this affect innovation? Does this affect equity? Um, Connie, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I'll I'll chime and I'll try to keep it tight so other people can comment too. I, I mean, this is what I I am trying to optimize my career for impact. And I think by being in finance, I can have maximal impact. So I guess that tells you that I think that funding plays a pretty strong role. And Tara, I totally agree, actually, with your point. And I think it's not an either or, it's a yet both and. And we need to be throwing all the spaghetti at the wall. The only thing in venture capital you can be pretty sure of is you're going to be wrong most of the time. 
Um, and the same is actually kind of true when you look at the history of agricultural practices. We thought that we were improving everything. And then now in hindsight, we're kind of like, oops, we made some mistakes there. We could probably do better. So I very much take an assumption that I'm not right. There's a million problems to solve. Most people are also not right. So we better make sure that there's a very large number of people working on solving these problems. That's where capital access becomes a problem just very concisely. Venture capital has a major equity and inclusion problem. Agriculture venture capital, even more so, I would argue. I'm aware of three female general partners in ag tech VC, all good friends of mine. I guess four if you count me. Um, and that women do not get nearly as much funding. That is a huge problem. It's true also for BIPOC folks and non-binary folks. Um, and I, like, I am trying very hard to help mitigate that problem. Um, also, that, that has all sorts of domino effects as to who's in control of companies, who's in control of hiring, who's asking different questions with diverse perspectives, all that jazz. Um, so I, without getting too much in the weeds of it, that has really, really huge limitations, again, in how we can have as many interesting people with different perspectives as possible, making an effort to solve the problems and questioning one another so that we can, again, mitigate against negative side effects of some of the solutions that we've got to try to, to um, solve. The one other point I'll make is in agriculture in particular, venture capital is a tricky asset class. The average, like in venture capital, you invest dollars to buy shares in a company. You do it when it's like a founder's idea. And you assume that there will be a liquidation event at the end of the day, or and by liquidation event, I mean, you're selling the shares. So if I bought shares for a dollar, I want to get $10 back on them. Um, and that means that company valuations need to be pretty high. And there's this kind of concept in Silicon Valley and, and VC world of unicorns, which is billion dollar companies. There are very few unicorns in agriculture. Most exits in agriculture happen by a corporate um, acquisition. Right. Um, and as a result, there, I think, is a real challenge in resourcing. And I use resourcing instead of funding often because I think you need an integrated kind of capital and resource stack. Um, but there's a real challenge in resourcing some of the needed solutions in agriculture. And we need to, I think, break a little bit outside of the venture capital mold to actually solve some of these problems. So breaking out of that venture capital mode, I like that idea of kind of an integrated investment. Um, what does that look like in the nonprofit world, Tara? Well, I loved I loved a lot of the points that you raised, Connie, because I think, you know, from the, con the consortium was formed to really provide this like different structure and to allow more inclusive, a more inclusive space independent of state processes that would allow sort of cross-sector, cross-agency um, discussion and decision-making, but could still influence state processes. And so it's I, I think we're seeing more structures like that exist. But <laughs> to your point, the challenge is that then how do you fund those? And I think the part of the problem is, number one, you... Um, it's important that they be funded from a diversity of different groups because you don't want to be beholden to any single interest group. Um, it also ensures that you have a more sustainable funding stream. You know, it, there's a diversity of perspectives, as you pointed out. As we think about really solving these complex issues, you need to have a really diverse set of perspectives that can push on and poke on all of those different elements of it. Um, but then you go back to why do people fund in things? It's because they want their return on investment. They want to be able to point at, to, you know, tell their shareholders, here's the return that I got on that. And yet when you're talking about public goods or you're talking about governance structures that support collaboration, that support creative or innovative spaces, nobody wants to fund those structures necessarily because of, you know, because they don't provide that ROI that you were talking about. And, and so I do think it's a tricky space to navigate as we start to transition to away from sort of these traditional siloed, um, 
both agency as well as interest perspectives that both Connie and Nusha spoke about. Um, and so I think there is space for, for all of these different funding sources to play a role um, in order to, to tackle these really complicated challenges. So Nisha, you you brought up kind of this concern about equity earlier um, and differential effects on communities and also the size of, of different farms. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, how investment may spur innovation or um, make introduce tension? That, uh, excellent question. I think maybe um, a follow on on what uh, we just heard and maybe in addition to that, we actually, I want to say about 10 years ago, did a study looked at uh, what's the sort of path to water innovation and what are the different funding and financing mechanisms that can enable um, uh, better decision making in the water sector, um, uh, especially because you it's not just about money coming in, going into something. It's also what is it going into, right? For example, and, and the most important part of, us, uh, part of it when it comes to private money is de-risking. How do you de-risk some of these investments? And that goes back to um, also the equity piece of it, because if you can de-risk something, if you can de-risk investing in something in a community, then people would come in and invest more in the process. There are some impact investors that are interested in a lower ROI if they can actually evaluate that uh, positive outcome. And we actually identify that in some of the work we did showing how uh, some of the sustainability focused funders and um, uh, some of the groups that are interested in climate investment or change in social outcomes, they're willing to kind of, and Connie can um, uh, can add to this, but sort of are willing potentially to go back. But you need to be able to track what does this mean? How do you measure positive, equi equitable outcome? How do you measure a social outcome? For example, I give you a simple example: green infrastructure, big topic, very interesting. Actually, the whole groundwater recharge that is very popular right now in California. It can be counted as a green infrastructure, right? The problem is you're dealing with nature. There's a lot of risk involved. There is no guarantee every drop that you put ends up in where it needs to go. Um, it can potentially be used, for example, you can take some of these farms out, build, I don't know, a, a park. That then, you know, just giving you examples, right? I'm not saying they're doing those, but that can be multi-purpose space, right? Or for example, on the equity side, you can actually build wetlands in some of the disadvantaged communities that would protect them from flooding or sea level rise. All these things sounds fantastic. They actually do work, but they are not deterministic. It's not like I do this and I get this out, right? It has a lot of different dimensions to it. It can put that park or that wetland can provide a multi-purpose outcome, or it can be a nice place people can relax, take their kids, can provide a better front uh, to some homes, then then the value of these homes can go up. It can provide a better air quality, for example, a lot of different things. But we are not equipped really to measure those things, add them up and turn them into a, an outcome, a, a, a rate of return in a way, uh, in a positive way. So I think that is the challenge when it comes to thinking about equity, justice, and, um, and actually multi-benefit solutions that can bring in a lot of other dimensions into this. I think government has a huge role to play in here. They can actually, what we saw in the energy sector, they, they did a couple of things that I think it's worth mentioning because every sector can learn from it and we can expand those to include water and ag and all that. With our energy transition, what we did, and I'm not talking about the one that we are going through right now, I'm talking about, for example, uh, California's renewable energy portfolio approach and how we passed a climate law and tried to kind of the, uh, change our energy portfolio over time. We did three things. We put money aside to invest in innovation. And then we put money aside to help people to pay um, um, their bills because the bill cost was going up 
they couldn't afford some of these transitions we were experiencing. And we also started focusing on investing in research that potentially feeds into that innovation. This three-dimensional thing helped California to do a lot of interesting work that informed what, where we are right now. And, uh, and try to access, uh, touch on every one of those topics, right? This de-risking, investing in research, providing access to resource for people who might not be able to afford it. And I think that that very much can be expanded to be used more uh, effectively in water, in ag, and in different, uh, different ways um, uh, that potentially can have a positive outcome. So maybe just a quick follow-up question then from, from an audience member, Miriam Axel asks and on policy implementation, and we'll expand this to policy or investment and or, or both, um, how do you ensure equity then? And how do you try to avoid those unintended consequences? And is there some kind of mechanism to account for historical inequities? And so I think we have that energy sector as, as one example. I don't know. Does anyone want to quickly give a thought on another? i quickly say that like this goes back to the side effects conversation, I think, that we've already started to have. I think also to Tara's earlier point, like we can't let perfect be the enemy of good or better. Um, as someone who lives in Missouri and doesn't have a lot of optimism around policy here, um, we can't let good be the enemy of better. We have to do some stuff now. Um, I think by, again, having diversity at the table and being intentional around looking at risks and benefits is the best way that we can do the least damage. Thank you, Connie. And maybe maybe on that note, we have just a couple of minutes left in, in this panel. Um, do you want to end on, on some closing thoughts around what, what better is for each of you and maybe what, what a diverse and resilient future looks like? Um, Tara? Oh, great question. Um, what does better look like? I think better looks like more people at the table. Um, really thinking about how proposed solutions are beneficial across a range of different individuals, interests, and ways of being implemented. Um, I think that's what better looks like to me. Connie, what does better look like to you? That and... Um, uh... It looks like having more leaders who look differently and come from different backgrounds, um, who have the resources and capital um, to do things. It also an important thing that I think there's an a, a important thing to be conscious of is the way that capital flows. And so by that, I mean, there's venture capital funds that invest in startups, but there's investors that invest in venture capital funds. And those investors are generally pale, stale, and male. Um, and so there are opportunities to use investment in venture capital to increase wealth, for example, amongst HBCU endowments. Um, and there are opportunities to um, increase exposure and opportunity to different asset classes, to different stakeholders that actually enable wealth to grow where it isn't right now. I think that's critical. And Nusha? I mean, all of those and I would say avoiding the concept of conformity as a way of bringing people to the table because everybody likes to bring people to the table that might look different from them, but talk the same way or, or function the same way. And then you are a little bit, if, if people who come to the table have a different culture, different way of dealing with things, different kind of approaches, often they're eliminated because they take the process, take longer, and they're not willing to engage. So we, they are, we have so many different ways of identifying people. And I think learning how to deal with um, disagreements, uh, engage with people with different cultures, accepting those is very important because be just just focusing on um, race and culture and race and color is not going to diversify a lot of the decisions we are making because we're just uh, focusing on 
one part of this problem. And I think one, what Connie said on money, money is super important. We can all say, no, it's not important, but money uh, often rules some, <laughs> rules the world, obviously. So it's kind of like trying to focus on those processes that defines where and how money flows is important. And I think one last thing I would say is for me, better looks like it looks like something the day that we can actually uh, be willing to take our resources and take our time to make certain decisions and be able to engage in a broader sense across the different disciplines. So the day that we break some of these fragmented, fragmented systems we have, and I end on that, that the day that we have better multi multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary people educated at academic institution that can come out and think about systems rather than just one box at a time, um, you know, as in addition to people who can zoom in, that would be, and from the scientific side, that would be my happy day because I know that those creates exchanges that expands people thinking and knowledge. Nusha Ajami, Chief Strategy and Development Officer for Research at the Berkeley Lab Earth and Environmental Sciences Area. Tara Moran, President and CEO at California's Water Data uh, Consortium. And Connie Bowen, Co-Founder of Farmhound Ventures. Thank you very much for joining us today. And thanks to our audience for joining us as well. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for having us. Wonderful Thank you. conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. What a great panel. Um, just it really highlights all these thorny questions that require this very multidisciplinary approach to thinking about them. And I also love the phrase of let um, don't let the best be the enemy of better. <laughs> don't let perfect be the enemy of better. I'm going to think about better for a while. Um, thank you for steering this really wide ranging conversation, Aaron. And thanks again to our expert panelists.